Thanks for joining me. Uh, as the presenter said, the topic will be Google Maps and drawing on it with Jetpack Compose. Uh, just a little bit of myself. I'm Luca Nicoletti, an Android engineer uh, living in Liverpool. That's my ex handle. I'll be posting the slides of the presentation later on today after the talk. And that's my YouTube channel. I share this with you because I have a series going on where I basically do um, the same thing I'm going to talk about today, Google Maps and Jetpack Compose. So if you miss anything during the presentation, feel free to go over there and watch my video to get the code as well. Uh, so Google Maps and drawing on it with Jetpack Compose. Um, a disclaimer, I've never worked with Google Maps without Jetpack Compose. So this talk won't be a comparison between uh, the two technologies that we are uh, that are available to us. And another disclaimer, by drawing on it with Jetpack Compose, I don't necessarily mean those kind of things, even if those kind of drawings could be done quite easily with Jetpack Compose. Uh, but you will need a lot of time to gather every single point on the map in order to provide it to the SDK. The library for Google Maps with Compose has been split into three libraries. There is the Android Map Compose library, which is the main one that contains the Google Map Composable, the controls and configuration for the Google Map, and a lot of drawing, so markers and marker windows, circle, polygons, polylines, and overlays. The second library is for the clustering, basically, and it is the Map Compose utility library. And then there is an additional one, which is the smallest one, and it is the Map Compose widgets that contains a scale bar and the disappearing scale bar. The map, this is the declaration of the Map Composable function. Um, before this library was released, if you wanted to use a map instance in Jetpack Compose, you had to wrap an existing view of Google Maps using the old Android view system inside an Android view composable. The map allows you to customize the map by providing some properties, which is a map properties and some UI settings. The properties has a lot of things you can enable or disable the indoor navigation you can enable or disable the your location the traffic highlight you can specify a latitude and longitude bounds for the camera targets so this would prevent the user from moving the map around outside of your target and then there is the map style option that lets you specify a style of your map there is a styling wizard, which can be reached at the link shown on the screen right now. Uh, the wizard provides us with six predefined styles that are shown now on the screen. And from then you can go ahead and customize each one of them as you wish. This is a deep deprecated way of styling your map and more on that later on. In the styling wizard, you can customize all those things, uh, ad administrative, landscape, point of interest, road and transit, and water body. And for every single voice of all those lists, you can specify different colors for the geometry. So the fill color of the area and the stroke, so the border, and also the color for the labels and the icons. From the styling wizard, you can then export a JSON file, which you can import in Android Studio in the row folder of the Android res resources. And then in the map style option property, you can use the map style option load row resource style, providing the JSON file that you just downloaded. But as I said before, this is the deprecated way of styling that. Uh, the new recommended way is to use map IDs. From the Google Map web console, you can create a new map by giving it a map, a map ID. 
and you can set a style that you created from the styling wizard to that spe specific map ID. And then inside the Google Map Composable function, you have a Lambda, which is Google Map Option Factory. And you can use the Google Map option dot map ID providing your map ID in order to apply the style to your current instance of the map. The map UI settings allow us to customize a lot of things and show or hide different controls on the map on your screen. The first one is the compass enable. This would show on the top left corner of the map a compass that is only shown if the map is rotated. And by tapping on it, the map will be re-rotated with the north pointing up. We have the map toolbar enable that is shown only if a point of interest is, select, is currently selected on the map. As you can see, there is a marker selected. And then on the bottom right, there are two new buttons, which is opening Google Maps or directly navigate to that point. We have the zoom, uh, the My Location button enable that is placed on the top right of your map. And yeah, just move and zoom the map at the user location. And then we have the zoom controls enable that places a plus and a minus buttons at the bottom right of the map in order to zoom in or zoom out. But that's just the customization of the map, and it's not really drawing on the map by itself. One of the ways to draw something on the map is placing markers and clusters. Those are the default markers that are placed on the map. Uh, we can custom, we can use the standard icon, which is the one on the screen right now, or we can use a, the, the standard icon with different hues. We can use a completely custom icon and we can specify a custom info window. This is the declaration of the marker composable function. The most important thing is the state, which is a marker state. And that's what lets you specify the position of the marker. If you want to use the default marker icon with different color, this is how you do. In the icon parameter, you specify a bitmap descriptor factory default marker, and you provide a hue. And we also have at our disposal different hue values from the library, and those are rendered in this way on the map when used. If you want to use a custom icon, you can provide a drawable directly because the icon parameter accepts a bitmap descriptor. Uh, but this, with this e simple function, you could actually provide a vector drawable or a drawable ID. Uh, you obtain the drawable using the context compact get drawable. You create a bitmap using the drawable width and height. You create a canvas using the bitmap. You draw the, beat, the bitmap on the canvas, and then you return the bitmap from the from the bitmap descriptor factory. And this is how you could go ahead and use it. You, you obtain the context. You use the bitmap descriptor. You provide an icon resource ID, and you provide that icon to the marker. Um, one point here is that you need to pay attention to is the anchor, because the anchor is default to 0, 0. So it would place the start of the icon at the top left corner uh, of your point of the positioning on the map. So you might want to change the anchor in order to move the icon around to perfectly locate the point on the map. And this is the result by just using a really simple icon I found on the internet. If you want to use, if you want to customize the marker info window, you need to replace the marker composable function with the marker info window composable function. This function also accepts a state, which is another mark, marker state where you provide the position of the marker and lets you uh, customize a few things. You can customize the icon, the anchor of the window, and then you have a content, which is the last parameter, which is a com composable where you receive a marker 
and you can draw you can basically declare any composable function that you want in order for it to be displayed in the info window this is how you could create a marker that has a custom info window uh, i specify a title and a snippet there uh, just because I do have this data and that those data, this data is used also in the custom info window down below, which is a simple column of the title, description, and an image. And those two latter are there only if declared and not now. And this is the result that we would get. On the left, it is the default info window. So if you don't use the marker info window composable function but just the marker and you provide a title and a description when you tap on the marker the title and description will be shown on the right is the custom composable function that i just show you if you happen to have a lot of markers you might want to use clustering because otherwise the markers can overlap one another Clusters allow you to group marker by distance. You can customize, you have full control of the graphic and also customize what happens when you tap on a cluster or a cluster item, which is a marker. The, to use the cluster, you need to use this interface, which is cluster item. It requires you to specify a position and then you can or cannot specify a title, a description and an index of the marker. This is a simple marker data class, which is a wrapper uh, of the cluster item interface. We specify the position, title and description and we default to a Z index of one, but you can also return now as Z index in order for the clustering function to handle the layering of the cluster by itself. This is the declaration of the clustering composable function. The only required things is items, which is a collection of the cluster item interface that we just showed. But we can customize what happens when you click on a, when you click on a cluster, when you click on a marker, when you click on the info window or when you long click on it. And then you can also specify the cluster content and cluster item content, which is what is shown on the map uh, at the position of a cluster or of a marker. This is the default implementation by just providing a list of five elements. And as you can see, the more you, you zoom in or out, the cluster are created by grouping together the markers. And this will be what you can do by specifying uh, cluster item content, uh, which, for example, for now is just a rounded square, uh, blue for the cluster, red for a single marker, and just place the number or the title and description. If you want to customize the cluster item content, be aware that you can't use the marker composable function inside of the cluster item content. And if you try to do that, you get an illegal state exception invalid applier. This is because the clustering function, as for cluster content and cluster item content, accept two composable, which are also marked as UI composable, whereas the marker composable function is marked as Google Map composable. So it, they can be used interchangeably as you wish. The, there is an overload of the clustering function that lets you customize the clustering even more by specifying a cluster manager. The library gave us a remember cluster manager function where we can specify the two composable that we can use for the cluster content and cluster item content and also specify a render. We can create a render by using the remember cluster render function that it's basically the vice versa. It still accepts a cluster content and cluster item content and a cluster manager. The remember cluster manager function returns a nullable cluster manager. So in order for us to use it, we would need to do a, a null save check on the cluster manager. We can then go ahead and create a cluster render as well and provide the manager that we just got to the render 
and then specify the render the manager inside the clustering function. Unfortunately, this is not enough because if you do that, the render is not used inside of the manager. To use the render inside of the manager, you need to specify that the render of the manager is the render that you just created. Another thing that the manager is useful for is the algorithm with which it groups or ungroup together the markers. There are two classes that are provided to us from the library, a non-hierarchical view-based algorithm and a non-hierarchical distance-based algorithm. The first takes into consideration the screen size, while the other just takes into consideration the pixel. And there is a function which is set max distance between cluster items that lets you specify how close together two markers has to be in order for them to be grouped as a marker, as a cluster, sorry. And once you pick your uh, algorithm that you desire, you can set the algorithm to your manager instance by just using the algorithm uh, setter. And this would be a slightly custom uh, clustering with different clustering render um, and different algorithm as well. Uh, I have a duplicate duplicated slide. Yeah. And then two other ways of drawing on maps are shapes. We have circles, polygons, and polylines. Circles are easy but tricky at the same time. The only required parameter is the center, which is a latitude longitude parameter. And that's the only one that you have to specify in order to use the circle composable function. Unfortunately, though, the fill color default to transparent and the radius default to zero. So if you use the, compo the circle composable function by just providing its center, nothing will be drawn on the map. I opened a feature request to on the library in order to require the radius parameter in the circle and change the default color to black, which is the one used in other composable function as we will see later on. And that's the link to the issue that I open if you want to upvote it so it might get merged in later uh, releases. This is what a circle could look like if you draw a circle on a map. This is how you would use it. We can specify the fill color, which is the inside of the circle. We can specify its radius. We can also specify the stroke, so the border color and its width, and also the pattern of the border. So for example, this just draw a lines, a space, a dot, a space, and keeps repeating. And this will be the result of that circle that I just show you the code. You can hide the border of the circle by just defining its color, so the stroke color to be transparent or changing its width to zero. The circle composable function don't, doesn't have a transparency parameter. So if you want to use a half transparent color, you would need to specify that inside the fill color. For example, here I'm just copying a blue but and specifying the alpha to be half. And that will be the result. Polygons also has just one parameter that is required, and it's the point, which is a list of latitude and longitude. So by just going with a list of latitude longitude uh, couples and using the polygons composable function, we end up with a polygon on the map. The it defaults color is black, but as I said before, we can change the default color with specifying the fill color and also the stroke width. And um, this is what we could go. The polygons also let us specify a stroke pattern. So as we've seen before, we can draw lines, dot, and spaces between the stroke. 
And here again, the transparency is not a parameter for the polygon. So if we want to uh, have transparent color, we need to specify it in the fill color or in the stroke color if we want that to be transparent as well. Polygons also allows you to specify a parameter, which is holes, that lets you create holes inside of your polygon. It's a set of list of list of points, latitude and longitude, because you can create multiple holes in your polygons. This would be by just providing a list of one list of points. And just to note that the border is applied inside of the polygon as well. And if you specify more than one list as holes in your polygon, you will end up with multiple holes inside of it. Two noteworthy things here. If the holes contains points that are outside of the polygon, e something weird happens where the part outside of the polygon gets, gets actually colored while only the part inside of it gets removed from the polygon. And another thing is that the order of the polygons, of the points of the polygons matters. As you can see, this would be a polygon with five points, but one of them has the order mixed up. And so the polygon is not drawn entirely. Um, polygons don't require you to specify the first and last point as the same point. So the, po the points can be missing one connection. It will draw the last connection by itself. This is not true for polylines. Polylines is basically the same as polygon. It also accepts a list of points and then has everything else defined as as with a default parameter. So we, if we can go ahead and just use the polyline function with the points, we get a line, a black line on the map. The, you, we can customize the color, we can customize the pattern, so we can have dashes, gaps, and points here as well. And we can also specify a start cup and end cup. The start and end cup is what is used at the beginning and at the end of the polylines. Here, it's really hard to notice, but if we zoom in enough, you can see that there is a difference between a square gap, a square end cap or a circle end cap. Polylines are also possible to be drawn with different color. And there is an overload function of the polyline function that accept a list of spans where you can specify different colors. Keep in mind that the polyline points and the polyline spans needs to be of the same size because actually the, the spans need to be one lesser than the points. This is because the colors are used in the segment connecting the points. So if you specify just two color, the first one is used in the first segment, and then the second one is used for the entirety of the other polylines and segments missing. Um, another thing you can create is gr our gradients inside of your polylines. And here again, we accept a list of gradients. If you specify only one gradient, this time around the gradient is applied to the entire polyline and not just between the point one and point two of your polyline. But you can also specify the same amount of gradients as you have points in order to have different gradients on every segment of your polylines. Now let's talk about overlays. We have two different type of overlay, overlays. And the first one is a ground overlay, which needs you to specify a position and an image. The image is again a bitmap descriptor, so you can provide a drawable uh, directly. And the position is not a latitude and longitude alone, but it's a ground overlay position. The ground overlay position give us two ways of initializing it. It's to create one by having latitude longitude bounds, 
or to create one by a single position, which will be its top left corner and its width and its height. The latitude longitude bounds instead requires you to specify the southwest and the northeast point of your overlay. So you basically create anchor points for the image to be shown on the map. The once you create a ground overlay position, as for example, the south here, I create a latitude longitude bounds by using the southwest and northeast. The anchor is another really important point because it lets you specify which point gets to drawn on the top left of the of your overlay, uh, which point of the image gets drawn on the top left of your overlay. We do have a transparency, so you can specify the transparency to the entire overlay and you don't need to apply a transparency on your image. The drawable bit drawable to bitmap descriptor, it's basically the same as before. The one I show you for the custom icon in the markers. This time around, I also scale the canvas in order for the image that I was using to be fit uh, with the real world representation. So for example, with the image on the left and the code that I show you before, we can overlay the underground to of London on, ma on the map of London. This needs some, um, um, require some research in order to find what would be the top left point on the image uh, represented on the map. And last but not least, we have a tile overlay, uh, which requires us to provide a tile provider. And we can also specify the transparency here. And the tile provider is an interface that provides you with a no tile, uh, which is an empty tile and a function that you need to over, override, which is get tile. You get three parameters and you need to return a tile. A tile is basically a square representation of the map. Um, the map is represented by several squares and the three parameters that we get are the X, Y and zoom of the map. At every zoom level, the number of tiles present at the map changes. This is uh, zoom level two. So we have four by four squares on the map. You can, you need to over, you need to implement the tile provider class. This is a coordinate tile provider, which is one of the class that you can find used as an example in the map compose library. And it basically, what it does, it creates a square for every tile, and then it writes inside the square, the three parameter that we receive. In the initialization, it just creates the border and draws the border. And then for every time the get tile is um, invoked, you we receive an X, Y, and the zoom level. And what the this function does is basically draw the X, Y, and zoom level on the canvas, create a, a byte array output stream, compress the canvas that we just got, and returns it as a tile. The draw tile coordinates function, as I said before, just create a canvas, it prints uh, the tile chords, which is X and Y, it prints the zoom on the canvas and returns the canvas. And this is the result that um, that's shown on the map if we use uh, the coordinator tile provider. The tile provider, uh, the tile at zero zero is at the northwest corner of the map. At zoom level, the entire world is, uh, is rendered in a single tile. At zoom level one, the map is rendered as a grid of two by two. And the number of tile is two by the zoom level by two at the zoom level. So the 
X and Y and zoom level that you get are not compatible with a latitude and longitude position. So you can translate them uh, directly. This uses the marcator point, which is basically a point represented on the map, which, but since the map, the, the word is a sphere, you would need to flatten out the sphere on a 2D plane. And then there is a slight difference between a latitude and longitude and a point on a 2D plane. Another example that we find is the URL tile provider. This is a subclass of the tile provider itself that requires us to just provide an URL in order for the result of that URL to be displayed as a tile for us on the map. As you can see here, I just created a template of the URL where I have a web URL. I specify the three parameters and I use an API key. As soon as the get tile URL function is invoked, I format the URL in order to receive back an image and that image will be displayed on the map without the actual application doing anything. All the computation here is rendered by a server. There are a lot of URL tile overlay services online that you can find. Those are the two easiest one I found to, to use. And for example, the image on the left represent the entire tile that I was using in the code that I just show you. And that's uh, the entire EUK. Um, if you zoom in enough, I overlapped the two tile providers, the URL tile provider, which is the same on, on in the two images, and also the coordinate tile overlay changing the color. And one thing I didn't mention is that you can use everything together inside the Google Map Composable function, since it allows you to write whatever you want. You can use circles, polylines, polygons, different type of overlays all together. And if you combine all the things together, you can end up with having a URL tile overlay with a image, tile, a ground overlay on top and a few markers as well. You need to play around with the Z index of the of all the function in order to place them one on top of the other and not misplace them. Otherwise one would hide the other beneath it. And that was all for me for today. If you have any question, feel free to ask them. Judas. Uh, sure thing. Uh, I'll just remove it for now. Uh, to... Sure. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I already uh, answered this question from uh, Zeus Almighty. Those markers support dragging. And um, if you implement uh, the Maps API cor correctly, yes, you can uh, drag the marker. But you should notice that markers are not meant to drag something up because they're meant to point something up. I just want to ask one simple thing. Could we make it possible with Compose as well? to drag a, a marker? Yes. Absolutely. So as I show the marker, accept a marker state where you define a position, you can basically make the marker draggable. And when the user drags around the marker, you would need to basically beforehand, you save the position with the remember function of composable. So you have it remembered as a value. And as soon as the user drags the marker and release the marker, you save the new position in the position that you saved with the remember function and provided it as a marker state of the marker. So the marker will be stay on the new position as well. OK, Mr. Zeus Almighty, I hope uh, you got your answer. You can. Uh drag your markers as implementing as an API or as a composable item. All right. Um, are there any other questions? I see no, no, any other questions? Uh, shall we wait a little bit for the questions? 
or do we have time? Hi, we are right on time, Hello. but we can give it a minute for a few questions. Thank you, Luca. Thanks to you for hosting. Bravo, bellissimo, signor. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Grazie tutti. Okay, Luca, if you want to say one more time where the audience can reach you. Yeah, sure. Uh, on Twitter, uh, it's Luca underscore Nicolette. Otherwise, on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, just search for name, surname, and you will find me. Awesome. Okay, thanks for the information, Signor. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you for helping again. Awesome. You're welcome. Thank okay. you for everything. Thank you, audience.